I don't even know where to begin, but I guess let's start here. OpenAI researchers, including ally of Ilya Sutskover, fired for leaking information out of OpenAI. If you recall that whole November fiasco with the firing of Sam Altman, the Q star leaks, which have been confirmed to be true, by the way. We still don't know what Q star is, but the leaks were real. Well, apparently some of the researchers behind some of the leaks, we don't know specifically which ones, they have been found and fired. Leopold Aschenbrenner and Pavel Ismailov. So we're not sure what they leaked, but it seems like they were working on AI safety. Pavel was also working on reasoning as well as AI safety. Do you think there's a chance that these people have links to some shadowy organization that is really against AI? So the information posted their pictures here, Leopold and Powell, and of course, it seems like they have ties to the effective altruism movement. All right, but to really understand what's happening here, we have to talk about effective altruism, EA as it's sometimes referred to. What is effective altruism? So a couple of quick disclaimers. First of all, I don't know effective altruism as well as I should. So I am relying on some of this information that I find on the internet. Some of it may be inaccurate. If I'm off about something, I'll try to post corrections in the comments or do a follow-up video. But also at the same time, I think it's very difficult to understand exactly what this thing is because I think while maybe it started as one thing, maybe even an altruistic thing, what it kind of morphed into, I think, is very different. And as far as I can tell, all of them are very secretive about what they do, what their goals are. And it's really difficult to figure out what it is that they actually want. Not their stated mission of, quote unquote, help humanity, but their actual mission that they're trying to do. What's the thing that they're trying to accomplish? So it started in 2011. Peter Singer, Toby Ord, remember Toby Ord, and William McCaskill. And sort of their stated mission was using evidence and reason to figure out how to benefit others as much as possible and taking action on that basis. So basically, they wanted to think about how to help humanity in the best way possible, kind of take the long view and kind of go about it in a reasonable kind of scientific method. That's as best as I understand it, which explained like that, I would say, hey, yes, this is a good group and I kind of share those beliefs as well. We should try to help everyone and focus on the long term and think about how to do so with evidence and reason. Again, the stated mission is not the problem here. In fact, here's William McCaskill, a moral philosopher at Oxford, right? So he has a book, What We Owe the Future. Here's Elon Musk saying, worth reading. This is a close match to my philosophy. So Elon Musk, a number of years ago, said, hey, this, this sounds like a good idea, right? Which again, on the surface, sounds like a good idea, helping humanity, going about it in an intelligent way, thinking in long-term versus short-term, right? Here's Stephen Mark Ryan saying, should be a good read. Will did a super fascinating podcast with Tim Ferriss close to a decade ago. Really got me thinking. I just realized I remember when I was, when Tim Ferriss published his first ever podcast, I think he was very nervous about doing a podcast, so he really hit the wine very, very hard during that podcast, so it kind of went off the rails towards the end there, but yeah, it was close to a decade ago. Actually, now it has been a decade, and I feel very, very old. But the point I'm trying to make is that it's important to understand that there's what we say we want, and then there's what we actually do, right? So I'm sure we all have a spam box full of various emails promising us wonderful things that at face value, yeah, maybe we do want. They promise fortune, fame, and adoration. So the headline is good, but the final result is you having to dispute various credit card charges because you've been defrauded. Effective altruism started with a good headline. Let's help the world as much as possible. How did it end? Well, it started with Sam Bankman-Fried, the founder of FTX. I haven't followed that too closely, but it sounds like he defrauded the various crypto investors. Sounds like they're missing billions of dollars. This is an article from Wired. Effective altruism is pushing a dangerous brand of AI safety. This philosophy, supported by tech figures like Sam Bankman-Fried, fuels the AI research agenda, creating a harmful system in the name of saving humanity. So Sam Bankman-Fried is in jail or I guess federal prison technically. He's not having a good time there. His lawyers are arguing that he should have a reduced sentence because he's uniquely vulnerable to the dangers of prison. 
being autistic, he has a hard time picking up on certain social cues that are, you know, very important to survival in a place like that, which by the way, I'm sure is 100% true. I do not doubt that claim. However, the lawyers are asking for his sentence to be reduced to five years. And I really doubt that that's going to work. So this was the opening I board in November 2023 when that whole fiasco happened. So we have Adam D'Angelo, so still on the board as of right now, founder and currently running Quora. So if you've been hearing a little bit more about Poe, their little chatbot that um, I believe is running Anthropics technology now. I think they've used both OpenAI and Anthropics Claude to run Poe, if I recall correctly, but he's still there. Then we have Ilya Sutskever, who has been strangely silent since the whole thing. We don't really know where he is. Then Tasha McCauley and Helen Toner. So we think Helen Toner is the one behind a lot of this. There was a paper that she wrote criticizing OpenAI, how OpenAI handled some of the releases that might have created a clash with Sam Altman. And that's the thing that kind of led to this whole thing. And Helen Toner is part of the effective altruism community. During the whole OpenAI board coup, they refused to talk about what was happening, even though they were getting calls from the attorney general. In fact, the same attorney general that I think put Sam Bankman Freed away called them. They had a two hour long conversation. Again, this is based on some of the leaks that we were seeing from OpenAI. They refused to expand on what was happening. They were still very secretive. They didn't want to get any information out there. And eventually that board was kicked out. Sam Altman came back to run OpenAI. And to this day, I don't think they ever explained what they were doing, for what reason. They put out a statement that had some words strung together, but didn't have any actual data. They didn't have an explanation. It was just like, we regret the occurrence of the blah, 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 but it didn't say anything. Right, I think this is the statement they put out. They're saying opening admissions to ensure artificial general intelligence benefits everyone. And the board has to prioritize this mission. Accountability is important. But it's even more important for AGI. We hope this happens. As we told the investigators, deception, manipulation, and resistance to thorough oversight should be unacceptable. And yet they themselves don't seem to be very open in what their concerns were, what actually happened. So for all their talk of accountability, they're not really accounting for their own actions. It seems to me like based on what I've seen, I just haven't found anywhere where they talk about what their motivations are. Here's Toby Ord, one of his books. He's again, one of the co-founders of this movement, Effective Acceleration. So this is posted by David Z. Morris. He's saying Ord is an unabashed advocate for unified global government who decides what's an extinction risk. And who the hell decides exactly how much is necessary extinction risk? And this is uh, from Toby Ord's book. Another promising avenue for incremental change is to explicitly prohibit and punish the deliberate or reckless imposition of unnecessary extinction risk. International law is the natural place for this. As those who impose such risk may be, well, national governments or heads of state who could be effectively immune to mere national law. So... It seems like what these people want to create is a unified global government that is able to punish democratically elected heads of state, of governments, if they perceive what they're doing to be an extinction risk, whatever that means. Like, how do you define what's an extinction risk? Who gets to decide, right? I mean, this seems to me like it would give them absolute power to jail anyone, heads of state, people running the country, hopefully elected democratically, to just put them away to remove them from the post or put them in jail with no explanation other than you pose an extinction risk. So going back to Ashen Brenner and Ismailov, Ashen Brenner graduated from Columbia University and has previously worked at the Future Fund, a fund started by the former FTX chief, Sam Bankman Freed. Again, that's the guy that's in jail and has his team of lawyers actively trying to reduce that sentence. But that fund was aimed to finance project to improve humanity's long-term prospects. And then a year ago, Ash and Brenner joined OpenAI, right? And several of the board members who fired Altman had also ties to effective altruism. Tasha McCauley is a board member of Effective Ventures, parent organization of the Center for Effective Altruism. And Helen Toner previously worked at the Effective Altruism Focused Open Philanthropy Project. And of course, both left the board when Altman returned as CEO. So this is Vitalik Buterin. So he is the guy behind Ethereum. 
Ethereum has for most of the time been the number two biggest and most successful cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. I don't track that stuff too closely nowadays, but it used to be, I think it's fair to say that most of the time it was number two. It probably is now. Yeah, I figured I checked. So yes, it's number two. And this is Max Tiegmark, Future of Life Institute. So another person that's seemingly sort of associated with EA because Future of Life and EA seem linked. So in May 2021, Vitalik Buterin burns 80% of, of his ship holding and uses the remaining 24 long-term charitable causes. So Shiba Inu is one of those crazy doggy cryptocurrency. It doesn't really matter. The point is he gives a lot of money to the Future of Life Institute. We're talking to the tune of 755 million. So not quite a billion, but uh, still quite a bit. Future of Life Institute uses FTX, so Sam Bankman's Freed, his company that defrauded investors out of billions. It liquidates the SHIB tokens, so it sells it basically, converts it into dollars, I assume. And they use that money to create the Vitalik Buterin Fellowship in AI Existential Safety. Everyone pats themselves on the back, the future of life, Buterin, Shiba Inu, Community, Sang Batman Street, Alameda Research. Right here's Max Tiegmark, Vitalik. Then November 2022, whoops, the collapse of ba Sang Bankman Freed, FTX, and Alameda Research due to fraud allegations. Boy, they got so lucky that they cashed out. Sounds like they were able to get their money out in time. The Future of Life Institute uh, posts for the EU in the Transparency Register listing Musk Foundation as the top contributor of, you know, three million, it looks like. But where's the nearly a billion dollars from Shiba Inu? Well, it lacks that amount, the amount they liquidated from the 2021 Shiba Inu donation, since the audit is still in progress. And the yearly budget presents Musk Foundation's donation as the prominent one, right? So the three and a half million from Musk is listed as the top one, not the close to a billion dollars from Shiba Inu. Then, of course, we have that pause AI experiments, the open letter, right? Everyone points to Musk as the person that funded the foundation, right? Then the update in 2023, the donation listing the 600,000 minor cryptocurrency. I guess it went down in value since the donation. In 2023, Future of Life Institute participates in the UK AI Safety Summit. Teague Mark addresses the US Congress and the EU AI Act has passed. They've pushed it through allowing for the regulation of general purpose AI systems. Here's an interview in one of the Future of Life Institute's co-founders talking about how they view protecting the world from AI, basically by making the hardware illegal and subjecting you know, software, the code that people write to pervasive surveillance on a global scale. Take a listen. I do think that governments, certainly governments can make things illegal. Well, you can make hardware illegal. You can also say that, yeah, producing graphics cards above certain capability level is now illegal. And suddenly you have like much, much more runway as a civilization. Do you get into a territory of having to put surveillance on what code is running in a data center? Yeah. I mean, regulating software is much, much more harder than hardware. If you like, let the more slow to continue. Yeah then like the surveillance has to be more and more pervasive. So my focus for the foreseeable future will be on kind of regulatory interventions and kind of like trying to educate lawmakers and kind of uh, helping and perhaps hiring lobbyists to try to make the world safer. Now the Future of Life Institute has a new grant program for global governance mechanisms and institutions. It wants to ban the creation of AGIs, and have various surveillance mechanisms. And this year, Future of Life Institute tells Politico that its efforts support common sense regulations. But what they're talking about is banning GPUs, these NVIDIA cards above a certain capacity. Those should be made illegal. What software people write should be surveilled. And if you also add to that fact the idea that Ord, one of the co-founders of Effective Altruism is talking about having some sort of a global government that's above heads of state, above governments, that's able to jail people for, you know, creating existential risks, which again is very vague. They don't really define what an existential risk is. They don't really talk through why they think AI might kill everyone, but it seems that they're just pushing for regulation, for having 
political power, global political power. My spam box is full of very attractive sounding headlines, but in reality, what they want is to rip me off and take my money. Same Sam Bankman-Fried and the FTX thing, they wanted to help everyone get wealthy and help the world, but ended up just ripping everybody off and losing billions of dollars of investor funds. Now, these people are saying that they want to save us from certain doom, certain extinction from AGI. Effective acceleration wants to help humanity, right? That's the headline. What is the actual thing that's going to happen? There is this funny commercial that was made by FTX for the Super Bowl. It was funny then. It's hilarious now because it featured Larry David. And Larry David was a skeptical character. He dismissed major innovations that happened throughout history, like the wheel, the fork, the toilet. And now he's dismissing the cryptocurrency exchange FTX. And the whole point of the commercial is don't be like Larry. Invest with FTX. What's funny here is we should be like Larry. And I don't mean the real person, Larry David, who himself sounds like lost a whole bunch of money on crypto because his salary was in crypto. They paid him in crypto. Can you believe that? I'm talking about be like Larry, this mythical person that can smell the BS when he sees it. Your email spam box full of women that want to meet you is a good headline, but it's fraud. They just want to get your money. Companies like FTX that say that they want to make you rich, it's fraud. They just want to take your money. And the people that are saying that they want to protect you from extinction by this scary software, say it with me, it's fraud. They want to install a global governance mechanism, ban and jail anyone that disagrees with them, probably because they believe that they can install themselves at the very top and become the absolute kings of the world. I hate to break it to you, but these aren't the good guys. Now, I have to say here, so in regards to Vitalik Buterin, I was kind of surprised that he was caught up in this. He didn't strike me as one of those people. And maybe this is me being naive. Maybe this is me being a little bit too trusting. But to me, the jury's still out on this guy. And he posted this image, which I thought was excellent. I try to do my best to not go all in on any specific view. I like to be a little bit more neutral. I, I have my biases. I have my opinions. I have my preferences. But I think now more than ever, it's important to try to understand the different opinions, the different sides. You can have your preference, but at least understand where the other side is coming from. One view is the anti-technology view. It's this idea that safety is behind and dystopia ahead. And there's quite a number of people that kind of share this view. Certainly the people that we've talked about today seem to see it in this fashion, or at least they say they do, right? Dystopia ahead, right? AI will kill everyone. AI will turn us all into paper clips. So people are saying it won't just destroy humanity and earth, but our entire universe will take over and turn into paper clips or whatever other scenario they envision. And that safety is, is behind us. We have to kind of stop technological progress, decelerate, learn to live with less, right? Less food, less comfort, less air conditioning, and, and move backwards into time. A lot of these beliefs kind of also overlap with this idea of depopulation, right? This is one thing that Elon Musk kind of rails against. He's saying, no, we need more people, more kids. We need the next generation. And he's kind of fighting against the forces. They're saying, no, we need less people. We need to reduce Earth's population. And by the way, if you're not following some of this, th these are real conversations that, that some people are having, including people that wield a lot of political power, a lot of influence, a lot of capital. But that's the anti-technology view, right? Outlaw GPUs and have a global worldwide surveillance on software. Because if we keep going down this path, there's doom ahead, right? And there's the accelerationist view that there's dangers behind and utopia ahead. So right now we're seeing a lot of progress with AI, for example, doing drug discovery. There's more and more overlap between genomics and AI. So potentially we could cure some hard to cure diseases, we can have people live longer. We can have more targeted drugs that help people heal without the side effects. We potentially could be seeing our first commercially viable fusion power plant that will make energy very cheap. People are talking going to colonize other planets, kind of removing the risk of potentially being just on a single planet as a species where one unlucky meteor can take everyone out. 
potentially, right? So these people view advancing technology as the right way and slowing down and letting the crippling regulations and these world governments ruled by people that maybe we don't agree with on everything. I think we can say that maybe those are the dangers, the authoritarian governments, worldwide surveillance, etc. And then we have the third system, and that is what Vitalik Buterin is saying. That's my view, that there's dangers behind and multiple paths forward ahead, some good, some bad. And this, at least, I can kind of agree with. The path forward has wonderful, amazing promises. It has some dangers, potentially. But I'm going to be 100% honest, and I'll come out and say this. The people with this viewpoint scare me the most. The people that want to install a global authoritarian surveillance regime that is bigger than governments in order to protect us from something vague that they can't even fully describe, that scares me. Because even if they are sincere and they're good people and they're super duper nice and they want the best for people, well, the next generation that takes over may not be. And eventually we're going to run into somebody that's going to use it for something bad. And at that point, it will be too late to do anything about it. But back to Vitalik's My Techno Optimism, this blog post that he wrote, it is big. It's very, 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 it's huge. It's pages and pages and pages of notes and bullet points and various uh, charts and graphs and whatever. It's table of contents is like a page long. His post also mentions Mark Andreessen as one of the faces behind techno optimism, the people that believe that technology, that AI will help the world. He is, by the way, one of the main guys behind A16Z, Andreessen Horowitz. They wrote this techno optimist manifesto on the A16Z website, and they believe that advancing technology is one of the most virtuous things that we can do. They believe in ambition, aggression, persistence, relentlessness, strength. They believe in merit and achievement. They believe in pride, confidence, and self-respect when earned. They believe in free thought, free speech, and free inquiry. They believe in the actual scientific method and the enlightenment values of free discourse and challenging the authority of experts. They believe in, as Richard Feynman says, Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. And I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. And they have enemies. And I quote, We have enemies. Our enemies are not bad people, but rather bad ideas. Those enemies go by different names. Existential risk, degrowth. Their enemy is stagnation, corruption, regulatory capture. Their enemy is speech control and thought control. They're saying our enemy is deceleration, degrowth, depopulation, the nihilistic wish, so trendy among our elites, for fewer people, less energy, and more suffering and death. So I might go back and read the Vitalik post, try to understand where he's coming from, but a quick AI summary that I did makes it seem that he is indeed somewhere in between. He is, in fact, somewhere here. He believes that there are specific dangers ahead, specific very good paths ahead. And of course, this bear behind us means that he believes that technology should advance. He believes that AI should grow with humans, that we should be integrated with AI, and has some pretty nuanced takes on these whole ideas of what EA is, what EAC is. So EAC is, of course, effective acceleration. So in that uh, Andreessen Horowitz A16Z, their patron saints of techno-optimism, I mean, the first person on there, and I think also the second, is one of the leaders of that effective acceleration or EAC movement. So to me, I think Vitalik is trying to be very nuanced in a very polarized world. I think he's somebody that thinks pretty deeply about this stuff but I just can't see him as an anti-technology person. Mutak believes that technology is amazing and there are very high costs to delaying it. There's this interesting chart he posted. So it's kind of like the different quadrants. On the right, you have AGI is coming soon. On the left, not very soon. And down you have, you know, the risk of P doom. So all future value likely to be destroyed by misaligned AGI. If you're an AI doomer or not, basically. And towards the top, it's unlikely that AGI will destroy everybody. And uh, they're saying here, this is not serious. It's just guesswork where everybody is. But you can see Sam Altman. And he's saying AGI is coming soonish. And it's unlikely that it's going to destroy everybody. 
you have the founder of Google up there, like it's highly unlikely that it's going to destroy us, right? They're very, very positive about it. Of course, at the very bottom, you have Eliza Yudkowsky, probably the most well-known AI doomer, you know, Demi Sassabis, who is part of Google DeepMind, who they've placed into, you know, more of the, you know, let's say he's cautious. He's a little bit towards, yeah, there could be problems, like we have to be careful. Jan LeCun is very positive. Andrew Ang, very positive that it's not going to destroy us. Interestingly, Gary Marcus is highly on here, but he tends to think that AI is not going to be very effective. And again, a lot of this is just guesswork. It's not serious in any way, but it looks like Vitalik placed himself in a category that AGI is not coming anytime soon and it's unlikely to destroy us. So he's not concerned, but he thinks that there's a chance. He's maybe a little bit concerned. He places his P doom, so the probability of something horrible happening, existential risk, as 0.1. He's saying, you don't have to buy the story, but in my opinion, it's worth worrying about. And he's saying his philosophy is DIAC, D slash ACC. In a podcast on Bankless, he talks about DIAC, what it stands for. So the D is defensive or kind of accelerating, but defensively, so carefully. But also kind of stands for decentralization, as in getting away from one potentially authoritarian government or some central system pulling the strings of everything and everybody. So I'll post a survey down below somewhere that will allow you to vote to kind of show where you are in this whole thing. Do you think we should accelerate technology as much as we can? Accelerate AI because there's more danger in slowing down than there is in accelerating? Are you more in line with the whole world government controlling everything, surveilling everything, and just giving them absolute power because only they can protect us from death by AI. I mean, I'm sure there are some people that believe that. Or do you think that maybe we do need to accelerate, but defensively, cautiously, maybe you're somewhere in between. Let me know. I'm curious where people fall on that spectrum, because I think these questions are going to be more and more relevant. As you can see, there are well-funded organizations that are trying to push through these regulations. They've succeeded in the EU, and they're trying here in the US as well. They want to control all forms of software, anything that could use neural nets. They want to control search engines or anything that predicts the demand, supply, price, cost, or transportation needs of products or services. Their powers are said to be very open-ended. So not a rule-making process or a due process. Just give them all the power and they will protect you. Over and over, the legislation has this one-way ratchet clause. The administrator has the freedom to make rules stricter without any evidence, but has to prove a negative to relax any rules. So easy to gain more power, but hard to give any of it up. No open source software. If it doesn't get a government okay, it cannot be continued. If you buy, sell, gift, receive, trade, or transport, even one covered chip, like an NVIDIA card that is covered on this, this act, well, then you have committed a crime. And this Frontier Artificial Intelligence System Administration can straight up compel testimony and conduct raids for any investigation or proceeding, including speculative proactive investigations. There's a massive criminal liability section, not just for people, you know, doing the math and doing the AI, but also any officials who don't do their jobs. And here's the kicker, emergency powers. The administrator of this organization that they plan to create can, on his own authority, can shut down the frontier AI industry for six months. Or I'm reading it here as 60 days, unless they are confirmed by the president or Congress, and then that can extend it to one year. They can take full possession and control of specified locations or equipment related to AI. And the administrator can conscript troops so it can basically raise an army to fight the nerds that are putting together various AI software. Also, of course, all the other agency have to consult this agency if they're doing any AI enforcement stuff. They amend the antitrust law to give the administrator a near veto on AI mergers. And they can use whatever funding they can get their hands on, including the fines imposed and donations. So wherever you are in the world, I think you should figure out where you stand on these policies on AI safety versus tech optimism. Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? You should decide. Otherwise, the decision will be made for you. With that said, my name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.